Alot Sharma, well, for her reflections on the burning issue of global warming and climate change, I'm joined now in the studio by Ronke Olubami Sheik from the Environment Facility of the United Nations Development Programme. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. And as you watched the end of that Glasgow COP26 summit and the final document that was agreed and signed. What were your thoughts on how successful COP26 has been? Thank you very much, Charles, for having me here again and uh, for hearing my views. Um, well, the COP26, well, as far as personally I am concerned, it was like, a, 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 like writing a statement and you do a comma. There is no full stop yet because most of the discussions, most of the agreements were just like hanging there. Mm. And there were not so many concrete decisions really as far as uh, this COP26 was concerned. And uh, uh, well, we just hope that, like I used to say, we just hope that somebody will do something and all those that are concerned will just come up to the real thing and do something that is concrete. Well, you have a point there because, I mean, we saw all these twists and turns um, in the negotiation and the agreement. I mean, the first week saw this flurry of announcements that seemed to signal early success, the cutting of methane, you know, um, more than a hundred countries signing a deal on deforestation, etc. But then the second week was marked by these draft agreements with changes in language that basically um, changed what they were going to mean for the world and for people like you who take your cue from things like that and then all the quibbling around financial arrangements um, you know from the richer nations to the poorer countries and then all the drama around coal and in effect the refusal to phase it out <laughs> Well, of course, what many people, especially the developing countries, are bothered about is the, 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 the genuineness of the commitments made by the developed countries, especially when it comes to the financial commitments. And unfortunately, as I said before, there is nothing really concrete as far as financial commitment is concerned. And then they are already talking about the next one, COP27, mm. in uh, Egypt and all that. And, uh, so we are waiting for another one year. I mean, that is just what it means. But uh, coming back home, I think uh, usually I always like, OK, if you really, there is no one country that can address this issue. Mm. It has to be holistic, and it has to be in collaboration of all the stakeholders. But, uh, but all the same, I think African countries also need to sit down and uh, look <coughs> inward and try to see what how our negotiation skills mm. can actually gather something better. <coughs> well, it's interesting <coughs> that you say that because a key problem was that financial issue. And I was having a chat with Ambassador John Campbell, who was a former Nigerian, I mean, American ambassador to Nigeria just a few days ago. And he was making the point that the difficulty with that arrangement is that the expectation is that the, the developed world will come up with enormous wads of cash and simply hand it over to people in the developing world. But oftentimes that's not possible. What is more realistic is that private sector investors who are investing in green energy and all that sort of would come into the developing world and invest and they as a government simply can't put a gun to someone's head and say come and invest in nigeria or wherever well the, the part of the government of the developed world is there and then of course now it is obvious to everybody that of course even business i mean it's obvious now that business as usual is no longer the issue mm. and then you now discover that i remember somebody was making the <coughs> presentation and i said well this is really good he really got it right it's like almost everything almost everybody now is involved in a kind of a climate action in one way or the other i mean it's somebody you get to a meeting and you ask who has solar in their house 
houses or who is doing this, who is doing that. And you discover that most of these things are through the private sector. Mm. We buy them through from companies. And then so it, it, they, the, the companies are also coming up to see that, look, I think they can also take leadership yeah, as far as this is concerned. Mm. And uh, the only challenge I have with the private sector is that uh, we still, majority of the world still run the capitalist uh, 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 system mm. of uh, business and of course if they come to Nigeria and invest in Nigeria the fund is plowed back to their world. Yes it is. So that's another challenge that we have to look at mm. and that is when I said I mean what made me to say it before that whether we are dealing with the government whether we are dealing with the private sector we have to develop our negotiation skills yeah beyond negotiation we have to also do something to exactly. up our own investment exactly. in climate change exactly. because it affects us quite badly and talking about um, how it affects the world I mean so many parts of the planet seeing real consequences uh, wildfires flooding heat waves in <laughs> Europe North America drought in Africa flooding as well and all the rest of it how have these things brought the climate crisis home to people in, in this year of extremes in terms of weather? Well, like I used to say, to people, to ordinary person, you don't even need, I used to tell, I've said it I think even here before, mm. you don't need to go to the lab again to know that something is happening. Uh, when I go to the communities, for example, you see that they have cut down all the trees and I ask them, when last did you see maybe just an ordinary antelope in this environment? They say, no. oh, maybe 20 years ago or something. And so that means your children are not even seeing this. What do you think are the uh, uh, causes of these mm. things? And then they were like, okay, then we start to discuss. So every, even somebody on the streets now knows that they may not be able to I mean, uh, scientifically or you know, articulate what is happening, but they know that the environment is changing. Mm. They know that the weather is changing. They, the rate at which you sweat and the all that, you go out now, stand it, especially in Abuja sun these days, and people are complaining. So people know that something is happening. Unfortunately, like I also say, we need our leaders to really up their game mm. and but, uh, but you, you were talking about um, beyond sort of the ordinary people anecdotally sensing that something is going topsy-turvy um, let's look at the science that you have to sort of obviously you you assess yourself a past part of your um, work are, are all these weather extremes because that's where some of the doubt comes in even by governments are all these, I mean, you know, Donald Trump and all the rest of them, are all these weather extremes directly linked to climate change? All of them the result of the global thermostat being tweaked upwards and increasing the risk factor because um, we even saw wildfires in the Arctic. Yes. So that's just it. Yes whatever weather pattern we see mm. and then we are experiencing the extremes how were we experiencing them before when we had trees when we had uh, the natural resources in place when we were not using um, uh, chemicals that would destroy the environment right. when we were not industrialization when industrialization was still at the barest minimum were we experiencing weather pattern like this yeah but but i have to say this though i mean it's a really complicated picture isn't it because we we also had that horrendous drought in madagascar for example that mm. caused many people to lose crops and starve and that was called the first climate changed change induced famine mm. uh, but when scientists examined it and ran a model of climate change with all the greenhouse gases that we put into the atmosphere and then they ran a model without it it was found that it wasn't climate change that was the real driving force behind that drought so i mean that just tells us about the complexity and complications of the driving forces behind climate change, doesn't it? Charles, if we want to sit down 
and analyze these things. I tell you, science will, I mean, of course, there is a science that will tell you the real thing mm. that is happening. There is also the science that is maybe political. I don't know. You understand me? And if this thing happened in Madagascar, and how can, how can anything happen in the atmosphere and you cannot, I mean, in the environment, and mm. you cannot link it to the atmosphere? The atmosphere does not exist uh, separate from the farmlands. Yes. So how can you say that something happened to the, if, if, if there is erosion, you try to find out what caused the erosion. Probably a tree was there that was holding the soil together. That's a good and then point. the tree was cut down. Mm. And then now you are telling me that the environment, the, the atmosphere does not have anything to do with the farming, the farming. It's the, 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 the intensity or the contribution as far as Madagascar is concerned, may not be the same with another place. Right. But the okay. fact that it is not contributing, I don't agree with that. Well, let's leave that hanging for okay. the moment. <laughs> but we always appreciate your analysis. Ronke Olubamiche is from the Environment Facility of the United Nations Development Programme. Thank you very much indeed.